Don't worry, there's nothing wrong with your television set. This is a pixie bell. The sound is much too high for human ears. Oh, there you are, Tink. Hey, get that stuff off of me. <laughs> if you're familiar with the story of Peter Pan, you know that a little sprinkling of Tinkerbell's fairy dust can make you fly. <laughs> a Tink. Tink, wait a minute. Haven't you forgotten something? Aren't you going to take the audience along? Come on, everybody. Here we go. Up to Neverland. Fly away with us. Second star to the right and straight on till morning. And discover the behind-the-scenes story of how the timeless tale of Peter Pan was transformed into a soaring Disney classic. But Peter, how do we get to Neverland? The story of Peter Pan began its life on the London stage in 1904. It was written by Scottish novelist and playwright James Matthew Barrie. Sir James Barrie was inspired. I guess he was visited by the muse when he created Peter Pan. It was just um, a marvelous idea. And uh, the testament is the fact that it's lived all these years and had so many incarnations. He created something that I guess will be immortal. In 1913, a touring company of Peter Pan was seen by this youngster. The boy was Walt Disney. He never forgot this epic of boyhood and its unique combination of fantasy and swashbuckling adventure. In 1924, Walt also saw a silent film version of Peter Pan, starring Betty Bronson as Peter. The film contained many innovations, such as a live actress playing Tinkerbell, and special effects that were the state of the art for their day. The silent film, however, adhered to many of the conventions of the stage version of Peter Pan, including the stars rather obviously flying on wires, a performer in a dog suit as Nana, and a costumed actor as the Crocodile. Walt Disney's efforts to make Peter Pan as an animated feature actually began in the late 1930s during the production of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, in an era when Disney's filmmaking imagination was at its peak. Animation was in many ways the ideal medium for Peter Pan because it's a fantasy. Walt Disney himself noted, the cartoon method gave us many advantages over the stagecraft of Barry's day, which no amount of pixie dust could cure. Here for the first time was a medium where the imagination uh, is limited. Animation could do anything. And you're so free to do things, to picture things, to show people things that you couldn't do on stage. In 1939, Disney acquired the screen rights, and by early 1940, storyboards were begun. These never-before-seen watercolor illustrations by renowned British artist David Hall were part of Disney's initial work. Hall had also done extensive visual development of Alice in Wonderland for Disney in 1938. In this early version of the story, Nana traveled with Peter and the children to Neverland, as seen in these rare original story sketches. Much of the art created at this time was also darker than the original play, and far more sinister than a typical Disney effort. You tell me the hiding place of Peter Pan, and I shall set you free. You talk. You'd better talk, my dear. This is your last chance, Tiger Lily! Tidal. 
Another part of this early work was an elaborate musical number for Captain Hook's pirate crew, which was ultimately replaced by a different song, The Elegant Captain Hook. An attempt to persuade the Lost Boys to join the pirates' ranks, this earlier song, written by studio music director Frank Churchill, along with Ray Kelly, is reconstructed here using a rare song demo recording, coupled with never-before-seen storyboard drawings of the original sequence. Hi, pirates. The only life for red-blooded men. If you're thinking of the future and you'd like a life of ease, if you'd like to make a fortune for your throne, if you've ever had a hanger and to sail the seven seas, then a pirate's life is just the life for you. Yo ho ho, a good earring you must go, so you might as well make up your mind to sign. If you'd like a share of plunder, if you care for blood and thunder, simply step right up and sign the dotted line. By 1941, a basic story structure was completed. However, the onset of World War II stopped the development. After the war, Walt Disney brought Peter Pan back into development. Progress continued throughout the 1940s, including extensive concept art by renowned color stylist Mary Blair. Finally, in 1950, he said, <laughs> now's the time, let's do it, and they did. The Disney version of Peter Pan has another interesting first. It's the first time a boy was shown as Peter Pan. There had been a tradition from the time of Maude Adams on the stage and right through Mary Martin and uh, in recent years, Kathy Rigby, Sandy Duncan, many others have done it, of women playing Peter Pan. But it was something that was broken, a tradition that was broken by Walt Disney by showing Peter Pan as a boy. Now, it's an animated boy, <laughs> but it was really a boy's voice and he was depicted as a boy, which is what he's supposed to be. Walt assigned the character of Peter Pan to animator Milt Call. I remember hearing Milt Call lecture about animation one time, and he said that one of the real challenges for him was animating weightlessness, animating a character who is sort of floating in midair, not flying, but just sort of floating. Uh, it's details like that that we in the audience are not supposed to think about. Of course, we shouldn't. We're involved in the story. Young Bobby Driscoll was assigned to the role of Peter. Where is that villain, Captain Hook? I'll slice him up and throw him to the crocodile. I guess Bobby Driscoll was an obvious choice for Walt to make because he was the resident juvenile star at the studio. Driscoll had debuted in Song of the South, after which Disney cast him in several projects, including So Dear to My Heart and as Jim Hawkins in Treasure Island. Get on with it, girl. Uh, my name is Wendy. Uh, Wendy Mora Angela Dodd. Wendy's enough. Walt also didn't have to look far for the voice of Wendy. He found what he called the gentle and gracefully feminine voice in the same actress who had played Alice in Wonderland, Catherine Beaumont. I heard about Peter Pan because the studio had started working on the writing part of it. I went directly from finishing Alice and immediately started working on the, the voice for Wendy. Oh, slave in the mirror, come from the farthest space. Through wind and rain, I... I am here, young mistress. Goodness, you got here in a hurry. I didn't get to finish the magic words. Well, it so happened that I was in the neighborhood. Hans Conried, seen here as the face in the magic mirror, was cast in the tradition of the stage play as both Captain Hook Boss, that Peter Pan. and Mr. Darling. Ouch! Ouch, I say! Hans Conried was inspired casting, you'd have to say, as Captain Hook. He was a consummate actor and had been uh, one of the busiest and best radio actors throughout the 30s and 40s. So uh, he was well schooled in how to act a part vocally. Peter Pan will be blasted out of Neverland forever. To bring the villainous Captain Hook to animated life, Walt assigned veteran animator Frank Thomas so I was wondering who was going to get the juicy assignment of doing Captain Hook, and, and I heard that Walt wanted me to do it. 
I thought, gee, putting me on the, that kind of a villain, a comic thing. The story man, Ed Penner, had seen him as a foppish guy, grand manners, you know, thought uh, uh, this was the way to live, with midnight suppers, wine, uh, all these gourmet connoisseur type things. While the director saw him as a tough, mean guy who'd shoot the cannon and shoot the, his own crew on the ship, and he was, he was a menacing villain. He was a menacing opponent for Peter Pan. <laughs> Now let me see, where was I? Walt knew that for his version of Peter Pan, Tinkerbell would have to be developed as a fully realized character. From the late 1930s on, character sketches trace Tinkerbell's development, and each reveals the then current conception of feminine beauty. The character that I worked on was Tinkerbell, and Tinkerbell was visualized as a spot of light, which no doubt was something like a strong flashlight that moved around on the, on the background of the, of the stage. In our medium, you couldn't just use a spot of light. So I came up with the design that uh, you see uh, here. She's a pure pantomime character, which uh, in itself I think is very interesting. That she didn't talk, but you know what she's thinking. There's been a rumor for years that she was patterned after Marilyn Monroe. Uh, it's the kind of likable story people will repeat because it sounds good, but it doesn't really wash because she was not a star yet. She was not a superstar or a pop culture icon. She was in Hollywood, but the designers and animators at Disney wouldn't have known who she was. I was Tinkerbell. I got this call to come over to Disney to do this audition, and they said, we want her to step on a mirror, that it, uh, a hand mirror that's on a dresser, look down, preen herself, and then suddenly see her hips and be very uncomfortable with the size of them. So I did. I said, certainly. And I stepped on and I looked down and I saw my hips and I measured them. I stamped my foot and marched away. And they said, uh, would it be convenient for you to come next Tuesday? So they knew that I had the imagination that they needed. The use of Margaret Carey as a live model for Tinkerbell was only part of the considerable reference used by Disney animators to bring Peter Pan to the screen. The second part of my performance after, after the recording was done was what was really uh, making the film. Although in this situation, it wasn't a film the audience saw. It was only for the animators, and it basically was done so that the animator could watch the action taking place. The audience always got confused when we talked about live action to help. We'd say, well, an artist needs a model. You've got to have something to guide you. But it's also very helpful in little ways of uh, a guy turning and looking back over his shoulder, how far do you turn his head? And, how, and you find if you got the real person to do it, this other arm here would come out as it turned, or have something come up to his chin, or some little thing you hadn't thought of. And uh, very often that would make the scene come alive. A codfish on a hook. I'll get you for this plan if it's the last thing I do. If uh, America has an art form, I'd say it's the Disney feature cartoon. After nearly two decades of work, dozens of story treatments, and thousands of drawings, Walt Disney's Peter Pan was finally finished. It was first released on February 3rd, 1953, and was an immediate audience favorite. It has remained one of Disney's greatest animated achievements and a beloved classic. When we watch Peter Pan, guess what? It's all safe. We all come back all right. It's a story that has meaning for everybody. Adults, you know, looking back and seeing this little boy who doesn't want to grow up. The, the idea of keeping that youthful spirit, not surrendering your childhood, well, that's a very strong idea and a very magical one that, that has enormous appeal. And then, of course, it was sprinkled with that Disney magic. I mean, uh, talk about, you know, a perfect marriage. Uh, Peter Pan and Disney. Love, I have the strangest feeling that I've seen that ship before. A long time ago, when I was very young. Oh.